Hey guys, this is Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN, and you're listening to the ML Sports Platter. It's the ML Sports Platter brought to you by Stanley Law Offices, Liverpool Physical Therapy, Rosie's Corner, and our great friends at Axe Exotic Pets. Go get your exotic pets, snakes, lizards, uh, parrots, you name it. They've got amenities, aquariums, and more at Axe Exotic Pets, Route 11 in Cicero. If you're in and around central New York, they're inside the plaza along with Drex Subs over there on Route 11. Awesome place. Carl and his staff doing an amazing job. Amazing job. You can hit me on Twitter at Mike L Sports and go ahead and download, subscribe, leave feedback and a five star review uh, to this podcast. Uh, it all helps. The reviews help. The five stars help. Um, everything helps. Uh, so please do share. Please do like. Please do subscribe. Please do download. Please do leave a feedback uh, piece and also uh, a five star uh, review as well. Cannot wait to talk to our next guest. He has been sworn in as the president of the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. We're coming off of just an incredible induction with Derek Jeter, Larry Walker, Ted Simmons, and Marvin Miller. Uh, As you know, the background probably for some of you baseball fans, Jeff Idelson was the president of the Hall of Fame and Museum. He uh, he left his post to go work with grassroots baseball, and, and kind of the time had ended for him. Tim Mead comes in. It was a short tenure. Mead resigns, and Idelson came back in. He was an interim uh, president for a little while, and then uh, they were looking for uh, the, the guy, and they found the guy. It's Josh Rowich. He is the uh, in his 27th season in Major League Baseball. He's been with the Diamondbacks, Senior Vice President of Content and Communications. Uh, he's been all over the place as well, uh, you know, in, in various roles and franchises, and uh, he is the president of the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum right now. Josh Rowich, thanks so much for coming on, man. This is a p- real treat for me, and uh, I'm pleased to talk with you about what you have planned for the Hall, and congratulations. Thank you so much. It's an honor to, to be here in Cooperstown, and grateful that I'm on the show. So, before we get into the Hall of Fame, last week's induction as we record this, your future, what you hope to accomplish at the Hall of Fame, how you ended up here, your career in baseball, you and I have a major, major passion in common. Do you know what that is? Uh, I don't. What do you got? It is the Dave Matthews Band. I thought you might say that. So will you be at the show tonight? I wish I could go tonight and tomorrow. Uh, it just didn't work out. Uh, the wife and I have got just a lot going on here and, and not working. It's going to it's gonna crush me not to be there because SPAC is my favorite place to go. I was in Syracuse, though. I did see him here. Um, I'm oh, cool. su- I'm super bummed that I can't see him this weekend because it really truly is one of the great venues in America. I've seen him 61 times. Where are you at now? I think uh, that after tomorrow night, tonight, tomorrow, I think I'm at 59. So you okay. got me by a couple, but we'll have, to, we'll have to meet up next time they're in Syracuse. Oh, for sure. And obviously you've seen him a bunch of times acoustic, Tim and Dave, I think, right? You've seen? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I've seen one show, it's back, and I know that's now, between that and Syracuse, those are going to be my new home venues for music. <laughs> so I'm Looking forward to checking out all the different areas uh, that are around around Cooperstown. No doubt, and and hopefully they'll do some winter tour stuff as well, and they'll be playing in Albany, which is a common thing, so you can hit that uh, as well. Your life in baseball got you here. When you first <clears throat> you know, had the inkling that you could be a candidate for the president of the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum, when was that, and, and, and how do you think you got this post? What was your greatest quality to get the post? Oh, wow. Well, I mean, I, I'm very grateful, first and foremost, to, to Jeff Idelson, who really kind of, I think, identified me as a potential candidate and reached out and just said, hey, I think you'd, I think you'd be a great person for this job. And, and obviously, the, the person between us, Tim Mead, um, also came from a similar background and was a great mentor of mine at, when I was at the Dodgers and he was at the Angels. So, you know, the position itself obviously requires a lot of um, relationship building, whether it's whether it's with Hall of Famers, whether it's with media, whether it's with donors, whether it's with patrons of the museum, and and most importantly, in a lot of ways, that the staff here. Um, there's a, there's a hundred people who call this their office. So I think having having a, a, an ability to, to connect with individuals on a on a one to one basis and really hopefully make them feel special. That's hopefully what I can bring here. And as I learn a lot about what it takes to actually run a museum, which clearly wasn't my background previously, and and things that may be a little bit different than what I've been doing, um, I really have a lot to, to thank Jeff Idelson because he really identified me and brought me to, to Jane and the rest of the board. And after I interviewed with some pretty pretty incredible people, um, it, it landed on me, which is pretty cool. 
Yeah, I'll tell you, um, the Hall is obviously a special place. Did you go to the Hall of Fame many times before you became president, Josh? I had been here three times. I've been here once with my dad back in about 20 years ago, summer of, okay. uh, of 2001, after I had a niece born in Manhattan. I, we drove up to I drove up here back 20 years ago, but then uh, I made it a point to come for the induction ceremony of Joe Torre and Tony La Russa, yep. both of whom I worked with. Joe, Joe, Actually, I went to Joe Torre's baseball camp as a kid growing up, huh. which is kind of unbelievable, wow. to why his plaque now sits on my desk here at oh. the hall. But um, wow. he was then, of course, the manager of the Dodgers when I was there. And, to, and I had planned to come to that induction ceremony, and then Tony La Russa joined the Diamondbacks a few months before that. So I was fortunate enough to come to theirs back in 2014, and then I came back again for Randy Johnson in 2015 when we brought the, a number of the executive team out here. So I, I had been three times before I started the interview process, and then probably three more times during the interview process before we actually uh, solidified the, the position. You know, it's, it's crazy. 82-year history of the organization – you're only the eighth president. It's it's a short list. I mean, it really is. You know, Stephen uh, Clark, obviously the founder of the Hall of Fame, grandfather of the current chairman, Jane Forbes Clark, Paul Kerr, Edward Stack, Donald Mark Jr., Dale Petrosky, uh, who I've had on a bunch, Jeff Idelson, who I've had on a bunch, and Tim Mead, and now you. That's it. You know, you're you're kind of like the Pittsburgh Steelers head coach. You know, you're it's, it's, <laughs> just eight, man. What do you yeah, think of that? Hopefully I'll have as much success as the Steelers have had over the years. But, I mean, that honestly, when I heard that, I remember that Tim, Tim is a very close friend of mine. And so yeah. when he got hired, I remember thinking, man, there's only been seven presidents in the history of the Hall. Like, it, it almost, I guess, surprised me in a way. But that, that does make it uh, even more special. And there's no, no doubt that I, I take this responsibility very seriously. And I recognize just how unique that only eight people have ever really... I'd say sat at this desk, but frankly, there's been even less people sitting at this desk because this office has only been here for the last 30, 40 years, not the full 82. So I'm very, very grateful for the people that came before me, and, and I'm looking forward to hopefully meeting several of them. I actually have a, a plan to try to go down and see um, Ed Stack on, on Long Island when I go and see my in-laws the next time I'm down there. So just want to learn from them, see what they, the, the knowledge they can impart on me and what they did over the years, and keep keep things moving in, the, in a great direction. A couple more for Josh Rowich, the brand new president of the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in Cooperstown, baseballhall.org, and get them all over social media as well. The great exhibits and displays, and you just get trapped in baseball history and, and in a time machine when you go to Cooperstown. Uh, you know, you attended Indiana University. Uh, I'm a St. Bonaventure grad, uh, and, right. uh, and, and the Bonnies are my A number one program, but I grew up in the Big East. I grew up as a Syracuse fan. I'm not over 1987, Josh, okay? We can, we can still get along, but I'm not over that, okay? What was your time yeah. in Indiana like? Well, what's funny is I wasn't even an Indiana basketball fan when Keith Smart buried your, your orange, so um, I, I came to learn about it uh, when I got there, and I, I spent four amazing years. I was actually, oddly enough, thinking about this morning that probably the best decision I've ever made in my whole life was to go to Indiana, and um, mainly because, not not only from a professional side, but, but far more importantly, I met my wife there and my whole family and everything that's happened in my career since then. Um, it's all my whole life changed with that one singular decision, and uh, absolutely loved my time at IU. Um, it helped me grow as a person, helped me grow professionally, and then ultimately led to my first internship with the Dodgers, and, and away went the career. Yeah, you joined the Diamondbacks. Uh, you were 15 years as part of the Dodgers front office, and then obviously Arizona. You've been in 27 years. You've been in baseball, I believe. Um, and now, obviously, at, at the Hall of Fame. And you're very young still. You're 44 years old. How difficult is front office life? Can you dive into that? I, you know, what, what, what's the biggest, what are the biggest challenges? And, and you know what, on the other side, what's the most enjoyable? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the camaraderie of the people is, is obviously the most enjoyable of any job. I think that's what makes any building. And it's just so rare when you work someplace that has a result every single night and that the, the morale of the company is going to depend the next day on, in a lot of ways, whether the team won or lost or if they're on a good streak or bad streak. And all of that, I think, is one of the best parts about it, that there's just, even even the other sports don't play every single day. So it really is this unique place where history can happen any given day. You could show up at a ballpark and see a no-hitter, though I didn't in 27 years of doing it. Um you know, it's just that's that's the best part, and I think the the biggest challenge is just it's. I tell students who are trying to get into this all the time that you have to absolutely love baseball because the sport is it's an everyday nature, and there would be there would be times certainly when I was coming up and still traveling with the team pretty regularly where I might go three weeks 
with forget a day off. I might, I'm not getting an hour off. Hmm. I mean, you're at the ballpark at eight thirty in the morning till yeah. eleven o'clock at night, and yeah. then you go on the road trip, and then you come back for another homestand, and you look up, and you've gone three or four weeks, and you haven't done your laundry, and you haven't gotten through anything uh, other than work. But you know, I, I never saw it as a job. I still don't see what we do as a job because I've, I've grown up loving the game since I was very, very little, and uh, just incredibly thankful that. Not only that I had the time to work at a historic franchise like the Dodgers, but a, an upstart one like the Diamondbacks. I got to be at MLB.com when they were kind of at their outset growing as a company. And now um, it's a strange path, but obviously here I am in Cooperstown and, and really loving it. Yeah, no doubt. You can get Josh on Twitter at H-O-F-P-R-E-Z, baseballhall.org. Josh Rowitz, the brand new president of the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. When did you first fall in love with the game? <laughs> You know, I started playing at T-Ball probably like most people, six, seven years old, and I kind of I have a memory of my first game at Dodger Stadium around 1983. I don't, I think that probably was my first game. I remember a little known outfielder named Cecil S.B. kind of robbing a home run. That's like the first thing I kind of remember down the stretch in '83. But it was right around that time that my uncle, who lived in Boston, was a huge Yankee fan, sent me some baseball cards, and uh, I just became a big collector from that point forward. I can picture the first cards he sent me. Um, I can. I just kept track of them for probably the next decade, and I just I, I fell in love with the Dodgers early on, and and uh, was very fortunate to get to meet all of my favorite players growing up. By the time I started working there, and you know, you just there's so many beautiful things about the game, the way it's played, and the, the people, the stories, um, just everything about it. I've, I've loved. I played all the way up through high school, and I knew I wasn't good enough really to play in college, but but I kind of. I also was I was the kid that, that hustled. I sprinted the first base on a walk like Steve Sachs did. Um, all of those things that made me, um, you just, I just loved it since I was a kid. And I'm really kind of pinching myself that this is where my, my path has led. All right. Where have you been? I know it's been a whirlwind and it's been early as, as the you know, Hall of Fame president here. It's been, what, a, a week, maybe a less than a week, uh, a, little bit, a little bit over a week. Um, yeah. Of course, you know, 2020 taught us that we have no idea what day it is anyways. Um, where have you been in, in at Main Street? Have you have you hit Mel's for the great tater tots and sandwiches? Have you hit New York Pizzeria? That's our new stop. We go there every year. Uh, have you hit Omega Gang Brewing Company? Yeah, where where have you been? Where have you hit? Where have you eaten and, and had some beverages? Well, what's funny is when we first got here, we had no we had no kitchen yet. We were still waiting on things to arrive. So <laughs> Take out every night. <laughs> almost, I mean, I think we've eaten to probably 15, 20 different places, including wow. all the ones you said, except Mel's. We have not yet oh, hit Mel's. get there. Um, I yep. need to get there, but they seem to have a line every time I try to make it over there. Yeah. And, uh, and I tried to make it a point, too, just to walk into each shop. Uh, on my lunch break, I might eat for half an hour, 45 minutes, and then I'll spend 15 minutes checking out. I, I think I've been to Tin Bin Alley and Mickey's Place and... I just kind of want to see what each store, how they're different from the others, and just how the whole ecosystem of Main Street and Cooperstown works, because I think that's a, we're, we're such a destination for people, as you know, and I think just understanding all of these places is important when I'm trying to speak about Cooperstown and, and why we're such a special place. Final one for you, uh, kind of a two-parter. Um, what do you hope to accomplish as president and the foundation that was ar- that's already there, the exhibit, everything that's already there, you know, the renovations from years ago, that, that mm-hmm. the Hall of Fame has gotten to their this place now. Um, that foundation, how much will you use that, and, and how, how much you know? Uh, what, what do you? How much? Are, what are you looking to you know accomplish as the president of, of the Baseball Hall of Fame, Josh? Well, first and foremost, I'm going to spend the, the first chunk here just listening and learning. I mean, there's so much that has gone right here for so many years. That's why this place is so special. So I'm not naive enough to think that I'm going to come in with some grandiose plan to change things. But the, the thing that, that Jane Forbes Clark and I spoke a lot about during the interview process and just that I routinely say when I answer this question is it's staying relevant. I mean, it's the, things change. The way we tell stories change. The manners in which exhibits are going to look will change. And as I, I walked around the hall with my son for the first time, uh, when we first came, right after the announcement, we brought the family here to come take a look at it and, and understand where we were going to be moving to. And walking around with my son, who's just an absolute baseball nut at 11 years old, um, gave me a view of how he sees the museum. He, he obviously gravitated to things like the touch screens or where you can make your own baseball card or um, the audiovisual things. And um, I think the key is really making sure that for the next generation of fans, as I hopefully will be here for quite some time as we start ushering in younger and younger fans, that we don't lose what's made it so special for the last generation, so to speak, um, but that we continue to make the experience 
relevant for all of the next generation. And there's going to be a lot of ways to do that. I can't say I know them all yet, um, but it's it's everything on site. It's also how we we reach out to the public and bring the things to the world outside, whether it's baseballhall.org or social media. I think there's a lot of just ideas percolating in my head, but the main thing I want to do right now is listen and understand what we've been doing, what we've tried, and and then we'll go from there, see where we take it. 27 seasons in the sport of baseball, front office work with the Dodgers and the Diamondbacks. He is now the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum President on Twitter, at HOFPrez, baseballhall.org. It's Josh Rowich. Josh, Enjoy uh, the tenure. I wish you all the best. Anything you need from me, I will do it. Interviews, promotion, you name it. And uh, more importantly, I hope you get a stone opener tonight and tomorrow <laughs> night. Uh, let's uh, let's grab that. Uh, let's grab that uh, shotgun into Billy's. Don't drink the water encore, right? Oh, I love it, man. I, I hope I hope I get it to see a show with you, Mike, and look forward to meeting you in person here soon. The ML Sports Platter is brought to you by your great friends at Bryant and Stratton College of Syracuse. Awesome time to be a Bobcat right now. Academics, athletics, excellence, bryantstratton.edu. Check out their nursing program. Two- and four-year degrees are always available. Classes are starting soon at Bryant and Stratton College. Bryantstratton.edu. I've loved working with the gang over at Bryant and Stratton College. I love what they have going on. And I said it a couple of years ago, you know, every day there's momentum at Bryant and Stratton College. You walk in the doors, you're at the games, uh, you feel it. I do public address for the basketball teams. You feel the energy, you feel the momentum. And a big part of that also is the women's soccer team. They are rocking and rolling each and every year. Their head coach is Alex Grigorita. We're going to get a quick update on this club um, you know, what's been happening uh, here in 2021 and, uh, and, and of course, you know, coming off of last year with Corona and, and all the adjustments uh, that have been made uh, for this soccer team. Let's bring in Alex Grigorita. Alex, welcome aboard here, my man. Nice being back. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no doubt about it. What have you learned so far about your team? You guys are 2-0, and right? You have 12 combined goals, uh, so scoring is not a problem. What, what have you learned about this club? You know, I learned that we have a way more uh, balance this year in all the lines. You know, I'm talking about defense, midfielders, forward. Our biggest challenge, however, is going to be to keep everyone healthy because such a short, such a long break that we had, you know, related to the, uh, obviously, you know, not being able to play and practice as much, uh, puts a little bit extra pressure on everyone's shoulders, you know. So our goal as a coaching staff, as a program, is just to make sure everyone is ready to go, 100% fit uh, and uh, ready for each and every game. So can you highlight your roster a little bit, Alex, for people who don't know, you know, some, uh, I think you guys have a lot of veterans on this team, correct? And, and that was, that was, uh, was our biggest achievement this year. We were able to to save and to keep every single um, player that, that's been with us for some time, you know, uh, despite some challenging times and everyone stayed committed to the program. So we do have quite a few seniors this year, you know, that's been with the program for two or more years, which is extremely exciting, you know. So uh, speaks violence about us, speaks violence about uh, this girl's characters, you know, and their commitment to, to Bryant and Seth, you know. And we couldn't be more proud and happy with their uh, commitment. And we were able to recruit some uh, uh, time players, you know, that covered the, the spots exactly we needed, you know. So we were able to add a couple more forwards. Uh, some some more uh, staff and defense, and and uh, definitely bring another goalkeeper, which which we needed. You know, so all of those just um, makes me as a coach extremely happy and excited. You know, to to work even harder this year to achieve our goals. So, as a head coach over the the years, you know that you've been in this thing. What have you? Where do you think you've grown the most, Alex? It, you know, for me, it's. Uh, actually more understanding the overall procedures and, and stuff, you know, and, and managing managing the team, you know, especially uh, at, at the team when we have when we have a little bit, you know, higher numbers because we have about 26, 27 players. Everyone wants to play. Everyone wants to, to perform, you know, being able to manage all of them, make sure everyone understands the role, um, be clear, you know, and, and straightforward with the players but at the same time offer an opportunity to everyone as well. You know, we we definitely established some expectations 
and, and most exciting is that everyone accepts the commitment, everyone accepts the expectations, and they're ready to go. You know, so that for me is definitely a success as a coach. Okay, four nothing, and then eight nothing. I mean, when when you win games like that in soccer, it, that's kind of like twenty to two or in baseball, or you know, forty. 41 to 10 in football or something like that so when you get up by several goals in a game like that do you do you call off the dogs or do you still play as aggressive how, how does it work in terms of respecting the opponent I've always wondered that absolutely you know and and for me first of all I'm very grateful to the teams you know the other teams in my team you know because they respect every single problem we play against and I'm always trying to focus on our game, score, you know, kind of goals on the somewhere on the bad burner. It's not as important. We try to focus on the process. Yeah. And I'm talking about processes, game structure, game system, game flow, what works, what doesn't work, whether it or not. But even when we win 8 nothing, there is still so much work that I see and so many, you know, like little things that we got to tweak as a coaching staff. You know, so those games are super helpful for us. And uh, by any means, like especially the first game against Junior College, it wasn't an easy game. They are in transition to become an NCAA Division II school, and they really came uh, strong against us, you know. But again, our our talent, our system, the way we play, you know, just uh, just was a little bit better that day. Uh, it's not. Um, it doesn't it doesn't mean that next time when we play against them, it's going to be the same score. It's a soccer game. This is why they love the game for, you know, you never know how next game is going to go. You know, so we just trying to kind of focus on um, on our game, on our system, respect the opponent, you know. And again, when you are a little bit up, you're right. You know, this is a great chance to try some new things, try some new people in different positions, um, maybe try a new system, give a chance to play to our um, uh, players that are on the bench, you know, or maybe don't play as much, you know, so that's a great opportunity. But at the same time, we're going to make sure uh, we still offer them a chance and full experience, you know, to score goals, to, to create opportunities, you know, and uh, despite the score. You know, uh, Alex, I just have a couple more for you here. Um, sure. You guys, as we record this, uh, I believe your game against Bryant and Stratton Albany has been postponed. Um, yeah. But you have four games left in September. You obviously have a full slate in October. Um, just kind of get into the rest of the schedule here this month and beyond. And boy, I'll tell you what, the opponents, the competition, the USCAA in general, it, it just seems like it keeps improving and the competition continues to be enhanced year in, year out, right? Absolutely. And and that's what's exciting about, you know, first of all, we have the, the liberty, you know, to create our own schedule. And uh, we, for us, it's pretty clear we want to play strong teams, you know, because that's the only way we're going to grow our program yeah. and, and develop, you know, and stay competitive, you know. Um, we also have games and traditions that we play for years and years and going to keep those as well, you know. So we open to anybody. And as far as um, the amount of games, we always talk about it's a, it's a long-distance run. It's not a sprint by any means. So the way we're trying to structure the games and the practices and uh, and recovery between that and, and everything else uh, with the goal towards the national championship in November. So basically, whatever we do right now, we kind of keep an eye and keep the national championship in the back of our mind, you know, just to make sure that we're trying to prepare for that. So it's kind of, yes, it's important, but we also have a little bit bigger fish to fry, you know, and to make sure everyone is fit and ready to go and, uh, for the national team. So that's, that's definitely uh, our kind of main goal. Okay, final one for you. Um, I obviously find your background very interesting and super cool. Um, you know, where, where you're from, I think, in, in, in the Republic of Moldova, right? And that's, that's um, between Ukraine and Romania. Do I have that right? Yes, that's, that's absolutely okay. right. Okay, so what is Moldova like, and and do you do you miss that life, the European style? Or I, I know I know there's a lot of culture at Bryant and Stratton College too, and you can share a lot of you know different things with people from different countries and different languages and everything. But do you miss your hometown? Do you miss Europe? Well, that's that's my homeland. You know, that's my hometown, and I would lie if I would say that I don't miss my. Uh, my friends, my family, my, my parents, you know, my, my sister, 
and, and everyone else who is still there or, or around there, you know. So, and I'm very grateful to the country, you know, that gave me a, such a great, you know, um, uh, background, education, and um, opportunity, you know, to grow. Uh, I chose to to be here, and I'm happy with my choice, you know. And definitely having such a background helps me yeah. hugely in my coaching career, you know, like as far as recruiting, as far as understanding um, what people go through. You know, good example. One of our freshmen, she after a week of camp, she was homesick. And I felt that just by looking at her, I felt it right away that she's homesick. We had a good conversation. I shared some of my experiences because I remember me being homesick after a month or so. So it, it just goes a long way, you know. And Moldova is such a great country that, unfortunately, over the years, it's been struggling, you know, um, finding um, its own path. But uh, hopefully now, these days, you know, we're definitely going to grow as a country, as a, as a culture, and everything will be will be awesome. We have some nice, nice, awesome people back there, back home, and I'm very proud of it. Yeah, it looks beautiful. I love Europe. I've never been there. Would love to go. And, and you obviously moved to the United States. Hard to believe, uh, Alex. It's been 12 years since you moved here, right, in 2009. <laughs> And you played for Bryant Stratton College. Now you're doing great things as the head coach of the women's soccer team at Bryant Stratton College, Syracuse. Alex, thank you so much for jumping on. I hope we can do it again real soon. Continued success, my friend. Definitely. Thank you so much for having me, and I'll talk to you soon. The ML Sports Platter brought to you by Bryant and Stratton College of Syracuse and Liverpool Physical Therapy. Pete and Mike and the gang doing a great job. Remember, no doctor prescription is necessary for the first 10 physical therapy visits in New York State. Make sure you go ahead and see for your post-op needs. Liverpool Physical Therapy right there on Old Liverpool Road. Tip of the cap, thank you as well to the Vince Aguirre Consulting Group, our friends at the Syracuse Fitness Store, and Stanley Law Offices. Together, they'll work to get you the maximum award. Unbelievable show. Thanks so much to Josh Rawich, the brand new president of the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum and the Bryant and Stratton College of Syracuse women's soccer head coach Alex Grigorito. What a great start to the year they've had. 4 nothing, 8 nothing wins, and uh, they will be in contention for a championship in 2021 without a doubt. Hit me on Twitter, at Mike L Sports. Make sure you keep downloading, subscribing, leaving feedback, sharing, five-star reviews all over the place where podcasts are found. And as I always tell you, enjoy the games. Mm-hmm.